Good morning. Good to see all of your smiling faces today. Welcome to Victory Church in beautiful Chattanooga, Tennessee. We're glad that you joined us today. Those of you that are here in person and those of you that are joining us online, thank you for being a part of our service today. You make this a special service because you're here. So thank you very much. Uh, I've got some uh, things that I want to share with you today that I believe will be a blessing to you. You know, I say that every week. But whenever you go to the Word, it's going to be a blessing to you, right? So I want you to, uh, I want you, we're going to look at our jumping off scripture. Do you remember, matter of fact, your Bible ought to fall open here by now to 3 John and verse 2. That's little John over towards Revelation. 3 John in verse 2 said, now this is the Apostle John writing here. And he says, Beloved, I pray, King James Bible says, I wish or desire. Uh, that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Now, he says, my desire for you, the thing that I want to happen to you is I want you to prosper and to be in health. I want you to prosper in all things and be in health. But then at the end, there's a little qualifier on the, or a little standard or a little measuring stick, if you will. And that is just as your soul prospers now your soul is your mind will and emotions it's your decision maker uh, it's where you think it's your thinker so he says it, it, it's important the way that you what your soul thinks so I, I would even say this you are going to prosper and be in health to the extent or in proportion to how your soul prospers or remember over in uh, Romans chapter 12 uh, we could word it this way, and that is the renewing of your mind. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, when you're, when you're born again, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there is a great spectacular event that occurs. It's just you can't see it. And, and that wonderful event that happens is your spirit, who is the real you, by the way. Your spirit is who is looking out of these eyes right here. Your spirit's the real you on the inside that's encased in an earth suit, and it has a computer, and that computer is your soul. So when you are born again, your spirit, through a marvelous, miraculous act of the Spirit of God, is regenerated and made alive unto God. But do you know what does not happen? Your computer, your mind, is still the same. It still thinks the same way that it used to think. It still thinks the same way that the world thinks. We, we, we call it sometimes stinking thinking. And that's oftentimes what we have to overcome. We have to overcome improper reasoning or thinking about things, renew our mind to the Word of God, because the Word and, and the things of the Spirit are contrary to the things of the flesh. And that's what it is that's trying to influence. We're influenced by our spirit, or we're influenced by our flesh, and our soul weighs those things and then makes a decision. Well, you want your soul influenced by your spirit more than you do your flesh. So that's a process. That's a renewing. That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about when he says to walk out your salvation with fear and trembling. He's not saying that you have to walk it out in order to be saved. He's saying once that you're saved, in order to operate in the fullness of it, you have to walk it out. You have to learn these things. The expression that we use is you are born again. We don't say that you are mature again. It, you're, you're not mature when you're born again. That's just the beginning. And so we learn how to walk in these things, and we learn how to grow, and uh, we learn how to grow up as, as strong, mature believers. Well, that comes from renewing our mind. So the, uh, the Apostle Paul here is saying, look, I, I want good things for you. I, I want things in your life that I, I want you to prosper in everything, in all things, and I want you to be in health just as your soul prospers. Now, the Apostle John also is the one who wrote John 10.10. 10. Have we ever mentioned that verse of Scripture in here before? 
Matter of fact, I don't recall a sermon that we've preached in the last several years that we didn't get around to John 10, 10 somewhere because it is an awesome verse of Scripture. It's a great dividing verse of Scripture that, that can really set your, your, your compass or, or set the rudder of your ship to, on course with this particular verse. Let's go ahead and turn to it. Uh, it'll set your course on or set your, your, your life on course. So in John 10.10, 10, we know that, that it says here that the thief uh, doesn't come except to kill, steal, and destroy. I've come that you may have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Now, I love the way that this says in the Amplified Bible. It just uh, The Amplified Bible uh, kind of amplifies the meaning of it. So the first part of it is very similar. The thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have and enjoy life we've talked before you see a lot of people every day that don't appear to be enjoying life all the troubles and tests and trials and pressures and anxiety and all the things that are attacking today and they're just they just don't seem like they're enjoying things and when you're in christ when you're walking these things, there ought to be joy in our hearts. Matter of fact, joy is where you get your strength from, Nehemiah tells us. So I, I came that you may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Now, what he's talking about here, he's talking about everything in your life. He wants you to live a full, abundant life in every area of your life. Now, oftentimes when we look at this and, and we look at what, what we find over in John, uh, 3 John 2 that we looked at earlier uh, about prospering and being in health, we look at health a lot. We look at healing a lot because healing is part of the believer's covenant. And we, we see in our, our Bible where Jesus bore stripes on his back for our healing. He paid the price for us to be able to walk in health. And we emphasize that. I heard one minister say that, that, that healing is the dinner bell of the gospel. Uh, you, you know, you start teaching on healing, people start getting healed. It, it starts to draw people. They may not understand doctrine, but they understand people are getting healed. So that's, that's a really good thing. Well, also, prosperity is included in that as well. And prosperity, and, and you know, I, I hear people talk about, well, that's talking about spiritual prosperity. And, we, and I've talked about this for the last several weeks. Look, these, these are natural things. When Jesus said, consider the birds of the air, when he said, consider the lilies of the field, are birds of the air spiritual or natural? They're natural. Are the lilies of the field, the grass of the field, is that spiritual or natural? It is natural. When Jesus bore stripes on his back, did he bear spiritual stripes? No, those were natural, physical whipping. So it's talking about things here that, that, are, are, uh, uh, that have to do with things in the natural. It's talking about physical healing, and it's talking about prosperity or wealth. Now, it's not talking about just having a lot of money. It's talking about prosperity in every sense of the word. It's talking about having all of your need met according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It's talking about seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of the things will be added unto you. Now, last week, if you'll recall, at the end of the service, I said, we we're kind of a little long here, but I want to get to one more verse of Scripture, but we'll be coming back here next week. Y'all remember I said that? I did. Uh, well, I'd like to get back to that right now. So if you'll turn with me to Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to kind of back up and get a running start at it, okay? We went to verse 19 last week, uh, and we're going to get there again. But uh, I want to, there's some more things that I want to look at where that's concerned this morning. As a matter of fact, I want to tell you something. If you get in the mully grubs, y'all know we've talked about that before, and I know you good people know what the mully grubs are. If you get in the mully, mully grubs, and I know I say this a lot, you know, you can come to this. You can come to Psalm 118. You can come here. You can, well, this is another place that you can come to if you've got the mully grubs. You can come to Philippians chapter 4, 
And uh, I want to look, we'll start reading in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Now you know the word rejoice is a very interesting word. Uh, rejoice, another way to say rejoice is to rejoy. So joy again. Be joyful and do it again. And do it again. And do it rejoice. Because we know what? That the joy of the Lord is our strength. Being joyful. Joyful is not happy. Happy is a byproduct of joyful. Joyful is a spiritual force. Happy is a byproduct. Joy is one of the uh, uh, fruits of the Spirit. Joy, the Bible tells us, is also uh, our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Have you ever noticed how you don't feel like doing a whole lot if you're down and depressed and kind of, you know, dragging? You know, I mean, you don't feel like talking to people about Jesus. You're just trying to get through the day. You're just trying to make it. You know, if I can make it to just get home. I could just get home and just sit down. If I, you know, but when you're joyful, there, there's power, there's energy in that. Uh, having cares on you is depressing and is also very draining and, and causes you to be weak. Verse 5, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. That's a good verse of Scripture right there. Be anxious for how much? Nothing. Do you know what being anxious benefits you? Nothing. But in everything, you know most of the time when you have anxiety, anxiety comes from the fear of what could happen. Not necessarily what, what is happening, but what could happen. It, it, it's the opposite. You understand that the fear is the opposite of faith. Faith very simply is believing that God will do what He says. Well, fear is believing that either God won't do what He says or, or believing in the fact that the devil is going to bring on you whatever, whatever it is you're thinking about. And you've got to watch it because those, that you'll, you'll be minding your own business and all of a sudden you'll get a renegade thought straight from the pale of hell straight from the pit of hell and it's designed to cause you to get over into fear because if you're over in fear you're not going to receive the things of god you're not going to receive from the blessings of god and by the way if you dwell on something long enough what happens is, is that fear seeps down in your heart and when it seeps down in your heart then it starts coming out of your mouth and you start giving voice to it and then now then that starts directing your ship towards the very thing that you're fearful of uh, the story of Job comes to mind. Remember, Job said, the thing that I have greatly feared. He didn't say feared. He said greatly. He was highly developed in fear. And his fear was, my children may have sinned. I know they're a bunch of stinkers. I raised them. I know they're stinkers. And they may have sinned, so he was offering sacrifices every day. But he wasn't offering the sacrifices out of faith. He was offering the sacrifices out of fear. And the thing that he feared greatly came upon him and, and, and actually caused uh, entrance into his family. But I'm not teaching on the story of Job this morning. I, I have a whole teaching on that. You know, I, I kind of like working these other series in here, you know, so that you'll, you'll go and listen to them. So, uh, you know, I... We'll probably get to the world that was and splat before the day's over. He said, so, so, and let your request be made known unto God. That's petitioning God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, one of the things, I, we, we love to use verse 7 a lot. And it is a powerful verse of Scripture that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. Well, but I want you to notice that this verse of Scripture starts off with the word and, which is a conjunction, which means it's joined to the previous verse of Scripture. So, the previous verse of Scripture is the one that says, be anxious for nothing. So there's a qualifier to the peace of God passing. All, remember the peace of God. Remember the word peace. I love this in the Bible. 
the word peace, the word shalom means nothing missing, nothing broken. I love that. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true and whatever things are uh, noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's any praise worthy, meditate on these things. So he's telling you how to get your mind under control. Think on these things. Dwell on these things. Give these things attention. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. So then he, in verse 10 he says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you, are, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Now that word content is a very interesting word here. The word content here means independent of circumstances. Content does not mean to be satisfied with being in a low state. Content means you have, he's been talking to you about peace of mind. Contentment is peace of mind regardless of your circumstances. Uh, Daniel in the lion's den would probably be a really good example of that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would probably be a really good example of that. Be content or, 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 or be, be uh, uh, satisfied in whatever circumstance. Be independent of your circumstance. As a matter of fact, that's really good to remember. Keep yourself independent of your circumstances. Your circumstances do not define you. The Word of God is what defines you. He said, then he goes on to say in verse 12, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere, in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Now, to, uh, he's talking about learn to live humbly and to live in prosperity. I've been abased, which is humbled, and I have abounded. So, to, to live in prosperity, I've, I've been on both ends of that. Now, I would say that everybody in here has probably experienced that. Everybody in here have, has had times in their life that there was lack, and then there, you've had times in your life that there has been abundance. And the Apostle Paul says, I've, I've learned, it, it, it doesn't matter which one I'm in, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm content whatever state, I'm, I'm independent of those circumstances regardless. Verse 13. Verse 13 is a really, really good verse of Scripture. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, I want you to, I think that the King James here is a more accurate translation, and it only changes one word. And I want to show you what that word is. We just read, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. King James Bible words it differently. It says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Now, what's the difference in those two, the difference in those two things? Well, the King James Version is emphasizing the anointing, the power of God. Now, the new King James is accurate because Jesus certainly is a who, and Jesus is the Christ. But I, but I like, in, in, you know, there are several places in the Bible that says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so we get from that that Christ, when we're born again, Christ comes and lives inside us. And the Bible doesn't teach you that. The, teach, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit recreates or makes alive your spirit unto God. Jesus Christ, the man, that's what the Bible calls him, the man Christ Jesus, is seated at the right hand of the Father. The Bible tells us that. It's the Holy Spirit. That's on, this is why Jesus said, if you blaspheme the Father, if you blaspheme me, you can still be forgiven. But you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, there's no hope for you. Because it's the Holy Spirit, it, it's His ministry, 
that causes the new birth. It's the belief that Jesus Christ died for us, but it's the Spirit of God's work, the Holy Spirit's work, that recreates us, that causes that miraculous event that takes us from spiritual death to spiritual life and also empowers us. So if you don't believe in that, if you don't believe in the third part of the Godhead, that's, uh, that's bad. So back here in uh, uh, Philippians 4.13, King James. So when he says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Remember, and I, I like saying this because somebody, I, I, I know all y'all have, but somebody out there probably hadn't heard this before. And that is that, that Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is a title. It means the anointed one. Well, when you have the anointed one, there is an anointing that goes along with that. And Isaiah tells us that the anointing is the burden-removing, yoke-destroying power of God. So the word Christ, when it's referring to the anointed one, it, when, when the word Christ is used by itself, Certainly it refers to Jesus. But when it's used by itself, oftentimes, I would even say a majority of the time, it's referring to that anointing. It, you, you see, it's that anointing that the church got on the day of Pentecost. The anointing that was on Jesus, the power that was on Jesus, was given to the church. He said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send one just like me. And so that's what happened. So that anointing, that burden-removing, yoke-destroying power of God is what enables you to do all things. And understanding that power that operates in your life enables you to do all things. It's that anointing that strengthens you. Now, can you plug in Jesus into that as well? Well, certainly you can. Like I said... He is the embodiment of that anointing. But, I, but I, what I'm trying to do is, what I'm trying to emphasize is that oftentimes the emphasis is, is, it's not taking anything away from Jesus. It's just emphasizing that anointing, that power is available to you. So, I can do all things through the burden-removing, yoke-destroying power of God, which strengthens me. I don't think that's too far of a stretch at all to, to look at it that way. Verse 14, Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica you sent aid once and, and again for my necessities. Not that I seek to give. This is so true right here. This, this verse right here. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. And I have to say, I feel the exact same way. When, when I see people give... Now, this may come as a shock to you. Hope you're sitting down. But there are times that I actually check the giving records at this church. I, I know, I know. Sneaky me. Well, I am the pastor. You know. And you know what thrills me? Is when I see consistency. When I see somebody, that, it's not necessarily the amount, although we do appreciate large amounts, and I have to tell you this, I just want to go on record and say, we do gladly receive large amounts, okay? We, 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 we're happy to receive those. And we'll give you a letter and all kinds of stuff. And you pray over it. We pray over them anyway. It doesn't matter how much it is. And, and, I, and I want to also emphasize, there is no gift too small if given in faith. Don't ever be embarrassed about an amount that you put in offer or you give towards something. Don't ever be embarrassed by that amount if you're doing it in faith. If all you can do is a dollar, then bless God, do it in faith. Because I can tell you, we're going to pray just as much over that dollar as we do over $100,000. So 
So I love seeing that. I, I, and you can tell. You, you can tell in people's lives when they get something. You, you can tell. Uh, uh, you, you know, you, you, you can go back and watch the, you know, somebody will be sporadic and all of a sudden they start being real consistent. Well, you know there is something that happened in there. Their mind got renewed to something. And as a minister, that thrills me because what I know is by doing that, I know the promises of God. And I know that when you give, it's given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over to men, given to your bosom. I know that when you sow to the Spirit, when you sow, and, and that's what that's talking about over in Galatians uh, uh, chapter 6, it's talking about uh, that God's not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. For he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting, and he that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap Corruption. So he goes to that. And it, then it tells you to give to every good work, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So he, he, he's describing all of that. Now the law, of, the law of seed time and harvest happens in every area. But so, so we don't want to exclude finances where that is concerned because it works where finances are concerned also. So it, it, it thrills ministers it thrill when when you see somebody get that because you know what's going to happen is that things are going to start improving and start coming to them they're going to start being blessed as they have been faithful to do that so he said you know i i uh, it's not that i seek the gift but I, i'm i'm excited i'm glad that fruit is going to abound to your account Okay, verse 18. Indeed, I have all and abound. In other words, he said, my needs are met. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Verse 19, and this is where, this is the only verse that I came to last week, but I told you there was more. And my God shall supply all of your need according to His riches and glory, by Christ Jesus. Wow. Now you understand. He's been talking about. How the church at Philippi. Has sent him. Necessities. Has sent him things. Has sent him money. And he says. I am so thankful. To see this in you. Because I, I love seeing. The fruit that is going to abound to your account. Because as a result of that, God shall supply all of your need according to, your riches, according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now I want you to look at that for just a moment. It says, And my God shall supply all. all and I want you to notice also, I'm going to make sure here, yeah, uh, do you notice that the word needs is, is singular? Now that's interesting, isn't it? Well, I wonder which need he's talking about. I mean, Jesus talked about need for clothing, for housing, food. So I wonder what... You see, to God, there is not individual need. To God, there is just need. And he doesn't want you to have need. So he's going to supply all. That's why the word all is used there. All of your need. And I love this part. Aren't you so glad it didn't say he's going to supply all of your need according to your checkbook. God's going to meet all of your need according to your savings account. Well, you know, if, if God can meet all of your need according to your savings account, your vision's not big enough. You need to elevate your vision. Because God desires to get involved in things, and He desires to put, or, 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 or he, he wants to put desires in our heart that only He can fulfill that we have to rely on Him, that we have to exercise our faith 
for him to come through and for him to show himself strong on our behalf. So it says, I, he, God will meet all of your needs according to his riches. Now this one's specified. His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now see, I like when it's used Christ Jesus because he's going to meet all of your need according to the anointing which was purchased for you by Jesus. Christ Jesus. Now, I have really good news for you. Did you know that God has plenty? Do you know he's never been late one time on his house payment? Do you know not one time has he missed a payment on his chariot? And I want to tell you something. That chariot's really nice. You talk about you talk about a payment every month. Oh my goodness. He 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 has matter of fact, the, the 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 wealth of heaven we can't fathom what that's like. Now I want to share something with you, and, and I, I wish I had the statistic right now, and I don't remember it right off the top of my head. Years ago I taught on something uh, matter of fact it's actually what i'm teaching on next week and i was teaching on a particular subject i'm not giving it away today uh, i was taking on a particular subject and i was talking about how much wealth is in the world and if you took all of the resources and the wealth that is in the earth today and you divided it by the number of people on the earth Everyone would be a multi-gabillionaire. Actually, a multi-millionaire. Every, every, if you took all of the wealth and divided it among all the people, everybody would be a multi-multi-millionaire. So, you see, there's not a problem with wealth. There's not a shortage of wealth. There is just an improper distribution of wealth. In heaven, that's not the case. When God sets up His throne on the earth, the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus, th that, that will be the case. Well, let me word this correctly because I've said so many things here. This not being when, when God sets His throne up here on the earth, that wealth is going to be distributed equally. There's not going to be people that have lack and people that have way more than they know what to do with. Everybody's going to have a... a, a Plenty. And he says, God will meet your need according to his riches in glory. God never comes up short. God has plenty of everything it is that we need. And when you fulfill the first part of this, when you're a, a, a happy, cheerful giver, God supplies all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, we have a really, really good example of prosperity happening in every area of your life. And it's in this story of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 27 and Acts chapter 28, where the Apostle Paul is going to Rome. And so he's gone up the chain of command, if you will. And, matter of fact, you can, you can turn with me to Acts chapter 27. So he's appeared before Agrippa in, in, at the end of 26. And Agrippa tells him in verse 28, he says, you almost persuade, persuade me to become a Christian. That's one of the saddest verses of Scripture in the Bible. And it's because it has the word almost. I wonder how many people there are that have lived, that are living now and, and will, that almost made it to heaven. Not by works, but by accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both, almost, and altogether, such as I am, 
except for these chains. When he had said these things, the king stood up as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them. And when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, This man is doing nothing deserving of death or chain. Then Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So, why in the world would Paul have appealed to Caesar? He could have been set free right here. I mean, when, when Agrippa said that, Paul could have said, okay, you know that appealing to Caesar thing? Uh, forget that. I, I, I don't want to do that anymore. Okay, turn him loose. But that's not what Paul's intent was, and that's not what the Lord had showed him. By going to Rome... He is now going to have the same platform that he's had here in front of the head of the ruling empire on the earth at the time. So he's going to have a voice to be able to spread the gospel throughout the world's power that time, the Roman Empire. Now it's a fascinating story of what happened here and we're going to have to look at it next week. We're not going to be able to get into that today. It would just, we, we can't. I'm not going to do that to you. So, it's a really neat story, though. Involves shipwreck, snakes, all kinds of neat stuff. All right, we're going to stop there for today. Man, thank you so much for being here today. My desire for you is that God's richest and best are yours. And remember, there's victory in Jesus. Amen. As I tithe and give offerings, I'm believing the Lord for vision and direction, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commission, favorable settlement, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, discounts and dividends, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased, blessings and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all my financial needs that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you agree with that, say amen.